What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video. And in today's video, I'm going to be building an awesome $800 gaming PC build that you can actually build right now in 2021. In this video, I'm going to show you how to put the system together step by step from start to finish, cover off each of the components and how much I paid for them before booting the system up, installing Windows, our drivers, and testing it out with the biggest games out there. Let's do this. Let's keep kick things off by looking at the motherboard, the RAM, and of course, the CPU. This is the AMD Ryzen 3 3100, one of the best budget processors around right now, with an RRP of around $99. You'll probably struggle to find it for that price point, so I've accounted for more in today's budget. This is going to work well for not only the GPU we've chosen, but right up to like a 2060 if you wanted to upgrade later down the line, and will work amazingly well. I'm going to be coupling it up with the motherboard choice today from Gigabyte. This right here is the B550M Gaming. This is a pretty similar board to their B550M DS3H. It's absolutely a budget motherboard, but it will work really well for the build today. With some decent VRM cooling, a pretty solid rear IO, and all in all a compact, affordable design that makes it great for a budget system. In order to install the CPU, it's a really, really easy process. Simply find the little gold triangle in the corner of the processor and line this up with the top left of the CPU socket, where you'll also find, if you look carefully, another little triangle. One of the great things about AMD CPUs is that you actually get a fantastic stock cooler included for free. This means you haven't got to go out and spend $40 or $50 on an aftermarket unit. It will usually come with pre-applied thermal paste, but because I've used this cooler before, I just need to drop a dab of my own on before fastening it down with the four screw hole locations on the motherboard. Do this in a cross pattern, aka tighten up each of the corners bit by bit and keep going around until they're all nice and tight and then we're good to go. With the cooler on then, we can move next to the memory or the RAM. Now this right here is Corsair's Vengeance RGB Pro. I've opted to go for a 16 gigabyte kit, though if you wanted to save money, a singular eight gig DIMM would also work well. Ryzen, of course, does prefer multiple DIMMs of memory, so that is definitely something to keep in mind. And I think the white heat spreader will match nicely with the deep cool case that I've sort of forgot has actually been on the table this whole time. So we're color coordinating today's build quite nicely. In order to install the memory, you you need to line up the notch on the RAM with the corresponding notches on the dim slot. The notch isn't in the middle, so just watch out for this and pull back the clips. It's then a case of sliding the RAM into place. Apply even pressure to each side and that's pretty much it. The final component then to install into the motherboard before we go ahead and move it into the case is actually the SSD storage. Now I've picked up a Seagate Barracuda 510. It's one of my favorite drives ever and you can learn why in our full website review in the card section now and link below. This drive drive is one terabyte, but I'm also going to link a 512 gig option in the description. So if you'd like to save a little bit of money, then that's also a good option. You can commonly find the 500 gig drive for around about $70 as well, brand new, which is always great to see. The drive is going to actually install into this M.2 slot, just above where the graphics card will go later. To do this, we need to remove the pre-installed screw that's already there, and we'll use this to fasten the drive back down. Slide the drive in at a 45 degree angle before pushing it down. It just makes things a little bit easier. The next stage of the build is to actually move over this completed motherboard assembly into the case choice today. Now this is a case that featured in a recent top 10 case video we made which you can find in the card section now. It's Deepcool's MA Cube 110 and it's one of the best budget cases ever. It looks really really cool as well with this two-tone white and black kind of color scheme and design. It's got support for really long graphics cards. It's got a tempered glass side panel that's really thick and quite hefty alongside a power supply shield and some good cable management options. Spending just that little bit of cash on a good case is always a good shout. If you'd like to check out some other great budget options though, Cooler Masters MB320L or the Neutron Lab range here in the UK are also great choices. This case is perfectly designed for micro ATX motherboards, which helps to keep the form factor compact and makes the build process that little bit simpler. Locate each of the holes through your motherboard. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and match these up with the corresponding standoffs in your case, which will circle now. Handily for us, these are all in exactly the right locations, which means we just need to pop in the IO shield, which is the metal plate you get included with the motherboard. That goes in the rectangular cutout at the back of the chassis before actually sliding the motherboard into place. It's often easier to lay the case down flat on a table because then you're not fighting in gravity when you try and screw the motherboard in. All the screws and stuff you need do come included with the case as well, so you haven't got to worry about buying your own or making sure you've got the right ones. There's only then 
two components left to install, the GPU, but first the power supply. And while we're doing this, I'm also going to cover off all the cables and the wiring. Now this build is super low as far as power consumption goes, which makes Cooler Masters MWE 500 a great choice. It's not particularly high end, it isn't modular, but it does have black cables. It is pretty reliable. It's got some great reviews and plenty of headroom for this build and even some future upgrades later down the line. Make sure you actually install the power supply fan down, which will allow it to draw in fresh air from underneath the case. Once you've done this, we can go ahead and install some of the power cables to make sure all of our components are juiced up and ready to go. The first of these is the 24 pin motherboard power connector. This is actually the largest of the bunch and just installs nice and easily into the motherboard, a little something like this. Pull the cables out the way and the motherboard is powered up. And the second is the CPU power connector, which just plugs into the top left hand side of the motherboard. While we're here, we're also going to attempt to do all of our front panel cables. These are the connectors which power up all the ports and buttons on the top of the chassis. In terms of which ones we need to deal with, we've got a HD audio connector, which works for the headphone and mic jacks on the case. We've got a USB 3 connector, which is the largest of all the front panel cables and is keyed, so we'll only go in one way round. And then we've also got our front panel connectors. These are basically little pins that go to the bottom right hand side of the motherboard. And I'll pop a diagram on your screen to make this a bit easier. This essentially makes the power button work. And if you get these the wrong way around, don't panic. You can just go back, redo them. Nothing's gonna break, nothing's gonna explode or anything like that. HD audio goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, a little something like this, while USB 3 goes on the bottom right hand side of the board as well. Nice and simple, nice and easy, and the front panel cables are done. I've also just spent a few minutes just cable tying some of the key cables away, and that actually looks really, really clean. I don't often show my cable management here on the GeekerWatt channel, but today I'm feeling pretty proud of it. And we can move on to the last component in the build. It is, of course, the GPU or the graphics card. This right here is a GTX 1650, and it's one of my favorite GPUs of 2021. Wait, James, what do you mean? Isn't this card a couple of years old, and aren't we living in a climate of 3000 and 6000 series from AMD and Nvidia? Yes, yes we are. But all of those cards are out of stock, and picking up even a used 3060 or 2060 on eBay is not going to end very well. You'll end up spending seven, eight hundred dollars on a card that's not even worth half that. Whereas the 1650 can be more easily found at a more stomachable price point. Plus, if you pick up a card like this and then upgrade to a 3060, for example, when the market goes back to normal, you're not going to lose all that much money, especially compared to buying a higher end GPU right now. Don't be fooled though by the 1650. It's a powerful GPU in its own right that works really well in even some of the biggest titles out there. We'll put some initial benchmark numbers on your screen now, but you'll have to wait until later on in the video for our full detailed gaming benchmark tests. Spoiler alert, we've tested 15 of the biggest games to make sure you guys are covered for whatever titles you want to see. This is a Zotac gaming version that's really great value. It's a nice design actually as well with a good IO and a decent cooler, but any 1650 you can find for a good price point is what I'd recommend picking up. It might look just a little bit silly in the build today given, you know, just just how small it is and it slides in nice and easily into the second and third PCI slots a little something like this. Make sure to actually screw the GPU down and then the build is pretty much done. The next step is to move on and sort all of our BIOS settings out, install our drivers and get Windows up and running. So let's do that. In order to do this you just want to grab a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse and the PC itself. We also need to create a bootable Windows USB drive in preparation. You can do this really easily using the tool I'll link in the description description below and a blank 16 gigabyte USB stick. Go ahead and plug in your bootable USB, which we will use to install Windows in a second, and hit the power button on the top of the case. You then want to repeatedly hit the delete key on the keyboard, and that will make sure we head into the motherboard's BIOS so we can check all of our hardware settings are correct, get the memory speed working properly, and do all that jazz. And there we go, so we're straight into the BIOS, and you can just see here that it's got a few different bits of information that I'll run through now. So the first thing to look out for under the tweaker tab is actually a extreme memory profile. You want to enable this as this will allow us to actually overclock our memory to the correct rated speed. So for us, we're going to jump our memory up to 3200 or 32.00. That makes sure the RAM is running at the right speed for our Ryzen processor. You then want to go ahead and jump over to the boot menu and make sure your first boot option is set for USB. This is the USB drive we just plugged in and this will allow us to install Windows when we next go ahead and boot the system up. So hit enter there. There, hit F10 to save and exit and wait two seconds. Your system should then automatically reboot into that bootable Windows USB drive. You will get a little bit of a Windows logo 
and of course the signature Microsoft loading symbol. It will then jump you into the Windows installation process. This is actually really, really simple. You just want to select the correct language and location and hit install now. You're then going to enter a product key if you've got one. And if you don't, just click I don't have a product key and it will switch you through to the next step with no problems. I'm going to install Windows 10 Home onto this PC. Agree to the terms and conditions. Select custom install Windows only and then choose the drive you'd like to install Windows on. So for us, it's simply our Seagate Barracuda 510. If you've got multiple drives and you don't know which one's which, look out for the capacities. And if they're the same capacity, unplug the drives you don't want to use now. So the only drive that's left is the one you want to install Windows on. Hit next. And then this next stage of the process will take a few minutes. You're going to be asked a few questions about privacy and data tracking and all that good stuff. But otherwise, Windows is installed, meaning we can install all the drivers to get the system working at the optimal performance levels. And just like that, we're now into Windows. Now, you might notice we've got just a little bit of a problem. We've got black bars down either side of the display. This will be easily fixed by installing our display drivers. So for us, we need to navigate into Microsoft Edge, which of course most people will probably use to actually install Chrome and then download GeForce Experience. Now this is available from the NVIDIA website. I will pop all these links in the description below and GeForce Experience, once downloaded, will automatically search for the right drivers for your graphics card and make sure they're installed. So it'll get our 1650 properly locked, loaded and ready to go. This can take a little bit of time as the NVIDIA drivers are quite a chunky file, but once we've gone through ours, we can jump through the setup process, look for the right drivers, get these installed and remove those pesky black bars from the display. And there we have it. The black bars are indeed gone. And there's only one more step left to do when it comes to BIOS, Windows and drivers. And that's all of the motherboard drivers. In order to do this, you want to navigate once again into Microsoft Edge. Sorry about that. And search Gigabyte B550M Gaming Drivers. There we go. And then just jump through and download a few of the key drivers. So we want all of our audio drivers. We want the chipset drivers. We want the LAN drivers. That's for your Ethernet, internet connections. And then any software utilities for controlling fans or RGB or anything like that. They're the key ones to download. Any extras that catch your eye, it won't hurt to download those as well. But those core set of drivers are what I'd recommend everyone deals with. Once we've done this though, we can go ahead and actually see how the system performs in the biggest games out there. But first, in typical GeekerWatch style, I think we've got a montage to attend to. I'll see you in a second for the performance figures, but first, roll that montage. <laughs> Nice one. So we've seen how good the system looks. We've put it all together. We've done the BIOS and the drivers. Now it's time to look at performance. On your screen now is a snapshot view, a summary, if you will, of all the different gaming benchmark tests we actually carried out. These will give you a really good idea of the overall performance of this system. And we're going to take a closer look at some of these titles individually, kicking things off with GTA 5. At 1080p, kind of medium normal settings, we got 83 frames per second on average, tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode with strong 90 and 99th percentile results of 75 and 70, which mean the game never really dropped below that 70. FPS mark. Watch Dogs Legion is next up and this is a similarly positive story. Here we got 56 frames per second on average at 1080p normal medium settings with 90 and 99th percentile results which showed some pretty consistent frame rates. This is once again tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode which not only saves us loads of time while benchmarking but also gives some really repeatable results that you guys can test with the same settings at home. Moving on to Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War and at 1080p sort of competitive settings where you tune everything down to low in order to maximize the frame rate we got 62 frames per second the 1650 is definitely powerful enough for 1080p gaming but in cold war you do have to tune those settings down to gain that all important 60 frames a second once you get there though the game still looks pretty good the frame rate was strong and steady with no lag no screen tearing or stuttering or anything of that variety moving on to apex legends one of the biggest games out at the moment and at 1080p medium settings we got just shy of 80 frames per second on average. 77 frames per second is really not a bad result. Tested as ever with both MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner and Nvidia Frameview. Moving on to Valorant, probably the easiest game on the list today to run, but still a really important test of a card and a system's performance. At 1080p high settings this time, we got 212 
frames per second. I don't want to make too many presumptions, but I'm guessing if you're spending this money on a build, you've probably not got a 360 hertz monitor, and as such, 212 FPS is more than good enough. The next title today is Cyberpunk 2077, a game which some of you will be a bit confused why we're testing. It's an incredibly difficult game to run, we all know that. Cyberpunk is a real handful, even on the latest high-end RTX 3000 series cards. Tuning the settings down to low at 1080p did give us 43 FPS on average, much better than what you'll find on the new Ryzen 5000 APUs, but sadly not near that all-important 60 mark, which is what we want to achieve in all games, not only Cyberpunk. Next up is a little bit of Fortnite. Here at 1080p competitive settings, the results were thankfully a lot better. 143 FPS on average, with 131 and 114 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. And I'm glad to report that even at high settings, 1080p, we still got over 60 FPS. So if you want that competitive settings, you can do so, but 60 frames at high settings is also possible. Talking of 60 frames, the final game today is Call of Duty Warzone, where we achieved the pretty impressive 68 frames per second. Knocking on the door of 70 FPS at 1080p, kind of normal medium settings with some of the select settings tuned down to low to really maximize that frame rate. This $800 build really is a pocket rocket that lets you get gaming on a budget in 2021. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a big old like rating, make sure to get subscribed to see more from me. Thank you for watching though, and as always, we'll see you soon.